knowing that the end is in sight, changes behavior. Ask any teacher as a semester approaches Christmas break or as a spring semester approaches summer break under normal conditions. We instinctively know the end is near. Try keeping your speed the right speed after a very several long hour drive to a friend's house and you know you're within the last 30 minutes. I actually saw this vividly when my kids became competitive athletes beginning in junior high. I just thought running was running, but my daughter was a competitive runner, and I soon learned from her coaches that it was critical what happened in the last 100 meters. It didn't really matter what had happened in the kilometers before the end of that long-distance race. All that required style, performance, form, exercise, all the things that brought in the discipline of running. But in those last 100 meters, races were won or lost. I also learned it later when my son entered junior high school, began playing competitive football with the school systems and and then with other leagues. The final quarter makes a difference. We know this here in Houston well because we have a professional baseball team that has made a reputation that is legendary for being the last inning Astros no matter how many innings it takes, as in last night. So knowing the end is near is important. So in 1 Peter, Peter is writing to his audience in Asia Minor, and he recognizes this valuable truth. And so in verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, he reminds them. He reminds them, you're turning the corner, you're turning the curve on the last lap. He reminds them, you're, you're looking at the tape ahead and this last hundred meters makes a difference. He's calling out to them from the bench to the field saying, look, you're in the last quarter. What happens now makes a difference. And he simply just says, after having talked about lots of different dynamics and issues that were impacting a church that was socially and culturally persecuted, he says to them in verse 7, in light of the end. The end is near. In fact, he's even more specific, and he's more, in a sense, sort of dramatic, but it is reality what he's saying. The end of all things is near. Therefore, and basically he's going to ask them to modify behavior. This is the end. Of course, he's talking about the end of all things. When Jesus returns, Jesus was scheduled to be with us twice He came the first time in the nativity in order to live with us, in order to understand us, in order to show his love for us, to teach us, to guide us, ultimately to die for us so that we could be forgiven and have eternal life. The second time Jesus comes back physically to this earth, it is to take us to be with him. And that is the end of all things, not just for believers who are looking forward to that moment, But even unbelievers who may not be anticipating or expecting that moment, it is the conclusion, it is the final tape for everyone and everything. Peter says the end of all things is near. In light of that, he begins to list 11 different behaviors that should characterize Christians in the end. Now, the reality is we don't know when Jesus is coming back. I don't have an answer for that for, that for you today. Um, I'm sure there's somebody on YouTube you can find that has that answer that they're certain about, but I'm also relatively sure they're wrong, and so I wouldn't waste a lot of time doing that. But I would significantly dedicate our hearts, our lives, and our energies to doing what matters at the end of the race. If we're going to reboot our lives, and especially if we're going to reboot our lives in the middle of a pandemic and with a whole new structure for what the future looks like, and we know Jesus is a part of that future, then I would suggest doing some of the things Peter says. The end of all things is near, therefore, first and foremost, be sensible. He says to be alert and sober-minded. Those words can be translated clear-minded or self-controlled. This is not the time to lose it. The end is not the time to lose your stability. The end is not the time to lose your mind. This is not the time to go crazy. This is the time to be sensible. Peter is extremely practical in his teaching. He says, look, if if the end is all near and if things are that critical, if they're that important, this isn't the time to to get distracted. If it's the fourth quarter, this isn't the time to think about getting together with the guys after the game. If you're in the last 100 meters, this isn't the time to think about taking the ice bath back in the training house. If this is the end of the trip, this isn't the time to think, you know what? 
I'll get distracted. Maybe I'll go someplace else before I get to my destination. Be sensible. Be clear-minded. Be sober-minded. Be self-controlled. This is not the time to lose discipline. He says, secondly, be prayerful. Be sensible. Be prayerful. And actually, our ability to be alert, our ability to be sober-minded, our ability to be self-controlled and clear-minded makes it easier for us to pray. Be prayerful. Just simply have those conversations with God. Don't stop talking to God in the midst of a moment where God wants to hear from you and God has the ability to move in this moment. Interestingly enough, I believe if you look at the corpus of Scripture, all the Bible teaches, it is clear God is just as concerned about the end as he is about the beginning. We have about six major chapters that talk about the beginning of all things. And then there are scattered references throughout all the Scripture that imply the very heart of God's heart is that He created us to know us, to love us, and as Creator, He is over all things, and He is worthy of all of our attention, all of our love. But there is an immense amount of time, Old Testament, New Testament, the entire last book of the Bible has 21 chapters dedicated to talking about what it looks like in the end. God is just as concerned about how we finish as how we begin. So it seems appropriate if the end is near that we should be praying. We should be talking to him about this moment. He actually understands it. He actually knows it. He actually knows what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So be sensible. Be prayerful. Be loving. Maintain constant love for one another. We're down to verse 8 now. Be loving. Just simply care about the people in our lives. And again, that can be harder. At the end of the race, you're tired. At the end of the game, you're tired. At the end of the drive, I am the one person you wish you hadn't traveled with. This is not the time to start criticizing, to start judging, to start start snapping, to start being antagonistic, to start being angry. This is the time at the end when we should be the most loving, when we should be the most considerate and the most constant. The people around us, the end of all things is frightening. We're not quite as frightened, quite honestly, because we actually know the end. We, we actually already know what happens. Not knowing is anxious. Because it's a church Sunday, we stopped the Astros game last night. We had it recorded. We stopped in the ninth inning. Now, I know because I accidentally saw it online that stuff happens beyond the ninth inning. But I don't know. And so the 10 of us that are in this room, if you know how last night's game ended, you are forbidden by your pastor your employer, to tell me how it ends because I'm going to find out this afternoon. But here's the thing. I read the book. The end of all things is in our favor. We win the game. But let's don't stop acting like like we're winning the game. If we know we win the game, why shouldn't we be more loving? The trying times should create consistent and constant love from us as believers because the winning, the victory is assured for us. Be sensible, be prayerful, be loving, be forgiving. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Now let's just talk about that for a moment. Because clearly Peter is not saying we have the authority for redemption. Our forgiveness does not create salvation. Only God has the authority because the breach of all mankind's sin is a breach of holiness and righteousness, disobedience against him. And so he has to be the one that forgives us. Jesus has made that pathway to forgiveness possible. His journey to the cross and his sufferings and his death and the victory of that journey in his resurrection, his being raised to life, is a pathway for forgiveness. God made it possible for us to be forgiven. John, the apostle, in the latter end at the time of his life, in the very end of his life, said if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Salvation comes only from God. God forgives us when we repent and confess that sin. This interaction of grace and faith and God's love allows us forgiveness. But when there are breaches against us or against our friends, the priority and the necessity of forgiveness becomes ours. He simply says love covers over a multitude of sins. We all sin. 
We're all imperfect. We make mistakes every single time. As much as we want to polish our lives, we cannot perfectly polish our lives. Which means there is somebody in my life today who needs forgiveness. There's somebody in your life today who needs forgiveness. There is somebody in my life today that I have probably offended and I have probably breached protocol and their personal righteousness and I need to confess. I need to acknowledge and I'm going to need them to forgive me. Forgiveness is a two-way street. Love covering over a multitude of sins is an environment of forgiveness that understands imperfection but is willing to demonstrate the grace of God and the love of God and say, you're forgiven. Think of it like this. When Jesus was asked by the disciples, teach us to pray. We want to be prayerful. We're alert. We're sober-minded. We're maintaining love. Teach us to pray. And Jesus said in one of the phrases of his prayer, forgive us. Pray these words. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Trespass is simply sin, so you can easily paraphrase that to forgive our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. You know what I like about that? Is it acknowledges both areas of fault. I have sinned, so I need you to forgive me of my sins. You have sinned, so quite honestly, you need me to forgive you of your sins. And the same thing is true. I have sinned, I need God to forgive me of my sins. Living in an environment of forgiveness. Be sensible, be prayerful, be loving, be forgiving, be hospitable. This is what I love about Peter. Some of what Peter says is kind of confusing and it's not an easy book for us to study, but I love his super practicality. The end is near. Simply be hospitable to one another. Catch this phrase without complaining. If the end is near, does it really matter if I'm hospitable? I don't know. I would think I would be so busy knowing that this is the conclusion that the last thing on my mind would be not to worry about hospitality. I could forget all the hospitable things I need to do. But yet if I'm supposed to be loving during this time because love and forgiveness will cover over a multitude of sins, then why not just be hospitable? We live in tense times. Paul's acknowledged that, and he understands that. He's living through COVID with two young sons. I believe they're seven and eight or eight or eight or nine in that area. They're probably watching. You probably watched Dad on TV today. You've watched me for five minutes, and it's boring, but Dad's coming back, so don't let him leave the house too far. His wife's involved deeply in ministry. Their whole family's deep in ministry. His wife's a part of KSBJ uh, special events, and we were talking before the service, so I'm not going to reveal everything, but he was talking about her job and her ministry and what God's doing in their life. Life, you know, they understand that. My friend, she's responsible for hospitality. But when pandemic hits, when quarantine hits, when confusing messages hit, when we don't know which way to go, what to do, and everybody's making different decisions, it's really hard to be hospitable. And if there was ever a time we needed to be hospitable, it's right now. It's right now. It doesn't hurt anybody to be friendly, and it helps everybody. And hospitality, as I understand it, is redefined for the moment. Hospitality for me is smiling at you and giving you a big hug. I, if, even if I smile at you, you can't see it except for the few moments I'm on camera because I'm wearing a mask. And if I want to give you a big hug, you need to say, whoa, stop. And I need to say, whoa, we need to practice social distancing, everything. But those are the normal definitions of hospitality. So I just redefine hospitality. The fact that I'm in this moment doesn't change my obligation to be hospita hospitable for one another without complaining. Find ways to be hospitable. In the end, all we're doing is showing that the love of Jesus is real, and it's real in any moment. So be sensible, be prayerful, be loving, be forgiving, be hospitable, be gifted. Every single Christian, according to Peter, Paul validates this in his writings as well, understands they have a spiritual gift. Peter says, be hospitable to one another without complaining. And just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others. When you became a believer, when I became a believer, God's grace enveloped our lives, gave us forgiveness, secured our eternity, but gifted us for service. And now Peter is saying, knowing that the end is near and that God has gifted us, utilize that gift. This isn't a time to just sit back and wait till it happens. 
This is the time to take action and to move and to, and to make strategy and do what's most important here at the end in the final moments. And part of that is use the gift God has given you and use that gift in a wise way. He begins to describe that. Be gifted, but also be managerial. As you have received this gift in order that you may serve others, do so as good stewards, that word literally means manager, of the varied grace of God. God gave me the gift. It's my responsibility to steward it, to management. God gave me my resources. I don't own anything. God owns everything. He established everything. He provided everything. And when it's all said and done, it's going to be his again. I am managing that while I'm here. Simply be good at managing it. Good at managing the gift. And then he gives an example of a gift. This one has always struck me because it's part of my gifting that we simply be inspired. So we've received the gift. Let's just look at this one gift of speaking for just a moment. We receive the gift. It's from God. It's not natural talent. It's not something we've developed as a skill. It's a gift we've received from God. We're going to manage it appropriately according to God's grace and, and the grace that we've received. And now we do so knowing that it's a demonstration of God's power through us. If anyone speaks, let us be as one who speaks God's words. This drives me and haunts me all at the same time. As your pastor, every Saturday night, truthfully every day, but especially on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings, it weighs on my heart heavy that what you should be hearing now is not just the articulation of my opinions or my thought processes, but what you should be hearing is a message from God, that the Holy Spirit living in me is a part of articulating this moment, and that this moment should be an articulation of God's grace in this moment. It should be a clear articulation of God's love in this moment. I have the responsibility to manage it. I have the responsibility to use it. To not utilize it would be a mistake, and in my mind, a sin. To manage it inappropriately would be a mistake, and in my mind, a sin. And all because it is critical that what happens, happens by the power of God. Because in reality, what you need this morning is not my opinion, not my articulations, not my skill as a speaker. What you need this morning is a word from God. That's the way my gift mixing works out. But it doesn't matter what your gift is. If your gift is mercy and you're serving in some capacity, maybe right now on the front lines, maybe as a nurse. And that gift of mercy is beyond talent, it's beyond personality. It's what God did when he regenerated and revived your life in a relationship with him. Now, when you are merciful to those people, you're not just simply doing something nice, you're not doing something professional, you're not just simply responding to your education or to the needs of the community, you are demonstrating God's grace. So that the people you nurse, the people you mend, the people you take care of, when they experience your mercy, they are experiencing the mercy of God. And so in all of this area of gifting, know that we're gifted, every single one of us. And there are tests you can take, there are Bible studies you can do, we can help you with that. Seek the areas where God wants you to serve. Manage it, steward it appropriately, and use it for inspiration so that people see God, which is the next point. We're going through these fast. Be transparent, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. Be transparent. Now, this is slightly different than the way we use transparency a lot. One of our four core values for our church is authentic relationships. Authentic relationships require transparency. It means that we want to be, have an authentic relationship. We, we tell you our blunders. We tell you our faults. We tell you our successes. We tell you more than you want to hear. Um, we do this all the time. But it's because we value being in a relationship that is authentic. We try to push aside the facades. We try to push aside all the, all the fake images we could possibly do and live in authenticity with one another. But this is, and to do that requires transparency. But this transparency goes beyond authentic relationships in its human form. It is an authentic relationship with Jesus so that when you see me, ultimately you see Jesus. Because that's, that's what Peter is saying here. 
He's saying, he's saying that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. And so if I'm gifted, that leads to Jesus. If I manage it appropriately, that leads to Jesus. If inspiration takes place, however we use our gift, whatever our gift is, they see Jesus. Be transparent. Be sensible. Be prayerful. Be loving. Be forgiving. Be hospitable. Be gifted. Be managerial. Be inspired. Be transparent. And be empowered. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides. It would be a bit of a disservice. It would be disingenuous if I was to say, hey, you need to finish well. Hey, we want to reboot our lives. We want to make sure we're ready for the very end. And if we're talking about the end of all things, as Peter is, we want to end this moment absolutely, be absolutely prepared. It would be a total disingenuous moment if I had admit to you the end is hard. At the end of a long-distance race in the last 100 meters, the runner is exhausted. At the end of the fourth quarter, in the last few seconds as the clock is counting down, the football player is exhausted. At the end of all time, we're exhausted. At the end of a message, I'm exhausted. The hardest part about understanding finishing well is it is our weakest moment. This is not everything we prepared for. All the stamina training helps at this moment, but it is insufficient, and it is particularly insufficient in the spiritual realm. If this is the end of all things, then be empowered. If anyone serves, Peter says, let it be from the strength God provides. I authentically asked one of our Sunday school classes this morning when I was on Zoom with them to pray for this team, to pray for the 10 dozen of us that are here each week. Because this afternoon's tough. We gear up. We do everything for this service. And this afternoon we drive off of a cliff. We're exhausted. We're fatigued. We're lonely. And we miss our church. And church isn't fun. And I'm going to be totally authentic at this point. We try to give you the impression from 11 to 12 on YouTube every Sunday that we're happy and having fun. The truth is we're not. We were designed as a church to be social. And we're taking our social responsibility very, very seriously. And we are attempting to protect our congregation. But every Sunday, we miss our people. This is not church. This is live stream. And there is a difference. Pray for those of us who make it happen. Pray for those of you at home. Pray for a cure and pray for an end so we can do what the church is supposed to do and be together again. In this moment of weakness, with the tape in view, with the end there facing the goal line, understand that our power and our strength is not in ourselves, but is in Christ. Which leads us to the very last point. Be worshipful. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Men, take the time to worship. Be sensible, be prayerful, be loving, be forgiving, be hospitable, be gifted, be managerial, be inspired, be transparent, be empowered, be worshipful, finish well. Thanks again for watching our message today. We hope that you have been encouraged. To hear more messages just like this one, subscribe to our channel. You can also check out past episodes. For more information on First Baptist Church Tomball, service times, or how you can get connected, go to fbctomball.org. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash First Baptist Church Tomball. We can also be found on Instagram at fbctomball. We hope that God has reached you today just as he has reached us. We are praying for you this week. Thank you.